I'm going to ask, I'm going to say it again. Good morning, church. All right, that's a lot better because, you know, I'm, I'm 40. I'm getting old. I need to hear you guys. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here on this um, stage to present the Word of God. I, um, I'm always um, in a state of openness to God during preparation of sermons because as many, you know, speakers or preachers will say, when you prepare a sermon, God is actually talking to you to the speaker. So God has spoken to me during this preparation, and I hope that this sermon will be um, edifying for you, for you all. Uh, before we start, uh, let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you again for bringing us in your home, in your house this morning. We pray that collectively as we worship together that the Holy Spirit can fill our hearts, fill our minds, and that this time, um, when the time comes for us to leave this place, we can say that you have visited us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there is a, a show, a radio show on, on uh, I think the channel is, is 97.9 here in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, it's hosted by a preacher that everyone knows here is Doc Bachelor. It's Questions Answers. I think that's how it's called, right? And, 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 and this show is part of a, a list of shows or, 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 or initiatives or projects from Amazing Facts, right? So uh, Amazing Facts is, is that um, independent ministry. Uh, um, I think it was um, started by, um, I forget his name now, but Joe Cruz, exactly. And now the current leader is Doug Bachelor. But Joe Cruz had the habit to start his messages with an amazing fact, right? Who remembers this? Yes? And, and today I'd like to start my message with an amazing fact. I'm kind of plagiarizing, copying, copying them today because I think this illustration is very in interesting. There is a, a very special man. He's actually an, an Olympian, right? And he was crowned the best of his discipline three times in a row. Right? And we're talking about the discipline of archery here, right? And the man is called Mr. Im. And he's a South Korean. And what's interesting about his achievement is that he's able to be one of the best, if not the best, while being legally blind. Right? So that's very interesting, right? He, he, he was crowned the best in archery, despite his, the fact that his visual acuity is decreased or impaired, he's able to propel his arrow with amazing consistency right in the bull's eye of that target 70 meters away, while he's able to see at 20 meters what you and I, I with my glasses, I have to say, can see at 200 meters, right? So when experts are consulted to kind of try to provide an explanation for this achievement, they say, or they argue that, yes, it is important to have a minimum of sight or vision to know where to direct your arrow, but the main factor that allows an archer, or enables the archer to be excellent is the control he has on himself. Very interesting answer, right? Because we would think that the most important, one of the most important uh, aspects of archery is vision. But they say, no, it's the control you have on yourself. And, oh, my clicker's not working, guys. Oh, there you go. All right. What's interesting is um, in the Bible, we also have... A group of men, so they, they had, uh, I want to believe they had good vision then, right? We have a group of men that is described in the Bible who had excellent um, precision when using their own weapon, which was a sling at the time, right? And, 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 and in the book of Judges, we see in, the, in the tribe of Benjamin, there are 26,000 men, all left-handed, and the text tells us here, that among all these soldiers, there were 700 uh, select troops who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone 
at a hair and not miss. Now, we all know the story of David, right? David was a young man, and um, as he was visiting his brothers, um, he heard a very loud voice insulting the people of Israel and their God, and he took it upon himself with the help of God to uh, vindicate the honor of the Lord. And he used it using a sling. But I'd like to draw your attention not on the skill itself, but on the three last word of Judges 20, verse 16. It says, and not miss. Now, why, why all these three words important? It's because the Hebrew word for the two last word is taha. And this word taha means not to not miss the mark. And this word is only used in one other context in the Bible. And this context is very interesting. You have the people Israel of Israel who, who just left Egypt and are, they're on their journey to meet with God at Mount Sinai. And as they meet, as they actually reach the mountain and they surround the mountain, God starts to manifest himself. The earth is trembling, there's lightning, there's thunder, and the people, for good reason, are fearful. And this is what Moses has to say. He says, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. And in Hebrew, the last word is translated by, again, taha, to not miss the mark. So now we see that this word, not, to, to not miss the mark, um, we can infer from the experience from Mr. M that being able to control oneself is not limited, that not, not, not the benefits of controlling oneself is not limited to archery, but here the text is suggesting that being able to control oneself to not miss the mark has also spiritual implication. Does that make sense? For Mr. M, he's blind. The experts say that it is his ability to control himself, to master himself, that allows him to be excellent at his craft. Here we have the word not missing the mark. And I like to suggest that not missing the mark is also, in a spiritual way is also dependent on our ability to master ourselves. Now, I don't want you to take my word for it. That would be wrong. Let's see what the Bible has to say about this principle. So Proverbs 16, verse 32. So this is written by the second wisest man who walked on this earth, Solomon. And he says, better a patient man, patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. So here we have the wisest king who lived on this earth who says, yes, a great man, a great warrior is of great value, but I can tell you that the one who masters himself is a greater person. Very interesting. And when I think of great warriors and the notions of self-control, I can't help to think about the one and only Alexander the Great. This was a great man, a great military mind. By the age of 30, he was able to conquer with his Greek soldiers most of the civilized world. But historians tell us that this man, about two years later, because he was in the habit of partying and drinking lots, and that brought his vigilance down, and he died poison, right? So again, great military mind, but some deficit was self-control, and that brought, brings him to his premature demise. But I'd like to read you now a quote from an author that I really appreciate. Her name is Ellen White. And she states the following, he has conquered self, the strongest foe man has to meet. The highest evidence of nobility in a Christian is self-control. He who can stand unmoved 
amid a storm of abuse is one of God's heroes. Interesting quote, right? It seems to kind of confirm this association between being able to master ourselves and living an excellent or, or, or living an excellent life. So if I go back to my example with Mr. M, he masters himself, so he's able to be an excellent archer. So he, she seems to suggest that if we master ourselves, we're going to be excellent humans. But again, this is, you know, uh, quotes from the Bible and from the spirit of prophecy, which are very compelling to me. But one could suggest, Dominic, I I'd like to have more concrete or scientific data about that. What does science say about self-control? Taney and his collaborators uh, in the journal, the journal of Personality, and these are atheist people, okay? This is what he states. He states, humans' ability to display self-control is the most beneficial human adaptation. Doesn't that echo what Ellen White just said? And this is a secular psychologist, right? He recognizes the value of self-control. Someone who can, through different um, factors in his life, whether it's, 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 it's the growth from being a teenager to an adult, uh, to, from a young adult to a middle-aged adult, through these different stages, if the person is able to nurture and develop, grow in self-control, it seems like it, it is very beneficial. Baumister, so Dr. Baumister is a very interesting person. He is actually the most quoted scientist uh, in the last decade. And in the uh, jur journal, Self and Identity Journal, he states, lack of self-control is most likely the cause of most modern societal ailments. That's a pretty interesting assessment, right? He's saying that our society has many issues. Very difficult to count them all. But he says most of the ailments, most of the issues that we're facing today, the root cause is a lack of self-control. So when we ponder on this statement for a couple of seconds, it doesn't take long to realize that he's right. Let's look at a couple of examples. Diabetes. Type 2 diabetes specifically is a disease of overconsumption of calories. Most people know that if they eat too much, it will have detrimental effects on their health. And yet, when we see that patine, we want another bite, right? That's lack of self-control. Heart disease. If you surveyed 100 people randomly in the street and you ask them, what do you need to do to prevent a heart attack? Most of them will be able to tell you with pretty good accuracy the principles of heart disease prevention. And yet, heart disease is the second cause of premature death in Canada. Lack of self-control. Sexually transmitted infections. We have the means today to eradicate sexually transmitted infections. Whether it's through abstinence or um, use of protection, we have the means in our society to prevent them. And yet, in the last decade, we see a sharp increase in the prevalence or frequency of these infections in our community. So again, lack of self-control. Personal bankruptcy. Le like living a life beyond your financial means. You know that you can't afford things, but because it provides you with pleasure immediately, you decide to indulge yourself. And then later... You have to go back to the bank and say, I'm not solvable anymore. Again, another sign of lack of self-control. Now, Peterson and his collaborators in, in a book called Character, Strength, and Virtues, and again, we're talking about atheists here, right? He lists the most impactful virtues or character strength that a human being can have or display. And he mentions first curiosity, then teamwork, courage, love, wisdom, and then finally he mentions temperance. So the first time I actually saw this, it was in one of Dr. Nedley's presentation, and Dr. Nedley is a president of Weimar University uh, in California, 
I, I kind of jumped in my seat as I was watching it because temperance is not a word that you see in the scientific literature. Temperance is a religious term, right? And yet, this, this psychologist, as he was reviewing the literature, because this is not an article, this is actually a textbook, Character, Strength, and Virtues, he uses the word temperance just to give some more solemnity to the fact that self-control, temperance is another way to say self-control, is extremely important. Now, what is temperance? Temperance is abstinence of all bad things and the use of good things with moderation. That's the definition of temperance. Now, I have some statements here, and together I'd like us to figure out if these statements indicate that the person has self-control or a lack of self-control. So here I have the first one, I choose to have fun even if I have work to do. Is that self-control or lack of self-control? Lack of self-control. I follow my feelings when I have to make a choice. That's self-control or lack of self-control? Lack of self-control. I can't resist temptation. Self-control or lack of self-control? A lack of self-control. When I want to have fun, I sometimes do things that my conscience con condemns. Lack of self-control or self-control? A lack of self-control. Now, what are the benefits in the literature for self-control? Is the factor most correlated with academic success? I'm sure that all of you know someone who has a very high IQ. Schoolwork has always been very easy for them during elementary school and high school, right? But once they reach university where you really have to put in the work, they perform poorly. Do you guys know anyone like that? I know a lot of people like that, right? They rely on the talent in university, but in, when you, once you reach university and graduate studies, you actually have to put in the work. So self-control, being able to motivate oneself to do what has to be done, is the, most is, is the factor most correlated with academic success. It's the most impactful factor to nurture healthy relationships. So if you have healthy relationships, uh, you probably uh, are interacting with people with high self-control, or you yourself have good self-control. It has a protective effect against addictions. It's protective, uh, it has protective effects against anxiety disorders and depression. It, 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 it's very helpful in improving time management and money management. Um, people with high self-control are less paralyzed by perfectionism. It's very interesting because some would say that people with self-control control everything. No, they control themselves, right? That's why they're less paralyzed by perfectionism. And what's interesting is just like eating broccoli, no, there's no adverse effect to self-control. The more self-control you have or you were able to nurture, the more benefits you'll be able to reap in your life. There's a dose-dependent dose response to self-control. The more you have it, the more benefits you're able to get. Now, for the solemn and really concerning part now. So, Taney and his collaborators, again, this, these are secular psychologists, okay? So, they recognize in the previous slides that this is an important aspect of the human experience. We need to nurture this quality. We need, we, we need this to have the happy life, the good life, right? But this is what he says. He says, despite great efforts, most of us will transgress another religious term, right? will transgress in our attempts to demonstrate self-control. Think about an athlete, right? A, a sprinter, for example. They will eat right. They will exercise for years and years and years. But you look at other aspects of their life, it will be a mess because they have selective self-control. Think about Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Mr. Universe, big muscles, Terminator, I'll be back, right? Extreme discipline to achieve that type of body. But if you know his story, you'll know that 
outside of the effort and discipline he was able to exert to achieve the body that he wanted, his life was a mess. So what we are seeking is comprehensive self-control. And this is what Taney is talking about. He's not talking about me being diligent in one thing in my life. He's talking about the comprehensive picture, the total picture. And he's saying that most of all will transgress in our attempts to demonstrate self-control. And I, and I would tend to agree with him. He says, and he continues and says, we still know very little about the way to nurture and develop this important strength of character. So again, he's first, he first acknowledges that it's important, but on the other end, he says, we have to be humble here. Although we know this thing is great, we don't know how to produce it in people. And that's a bit discouraging for a researcher. Right? Because now the quest is going to be how do we make this more available to everyone? How can we create comprehensive self-control? How, how do we make it a reality in a person's life? So now we reviewed information from a spiritual perspective. We, we had a quote from Solomon, right, who stated that it is it is better to be a person who masters himself than to be a, a great conqueror. We read a quote from Ellen White who confirms that self-control is the highest noble character trait that a Christian can aspire to develop. And the science confirms it. But I can totally hear now some individuals say, but Dominic, why focus on self-control because what is important as a christian is for us to be forgiven because christians aren't perfect right they're just forgiven and though it's true that we are forgiven we need to you know think things through right it's, a, it's an afternoon in Palestine, and the woman is caught doing something she was not supposed to do. She's brought out, and many Pharisees are dragging her out of, where, out of the tent in which she was laying, and they're grabbing stones. Right? Jesus comes, kneels down, and starts to write names on the ground, and one by one, the accusers of this woman who was committing adultery leave. And this is what Jesus says. He says, he first asks, where are your accusers? They left. And then um, Jesus says, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Go now and stop Missing the mark, right? Another example, this, this man has been blind for all his life, right? He, he, he heard about the possibility of an angel moving the waters of the pool in Bethesda. But no one is, is there to help him go into the water when the water moves. Because it was believed that when the water moves, you can be healed of any ailments that you may have. But Jesus comes and he heals him. And Jesus meets with them in the temple, and this is what Jesus tells them. See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. So here we have two examples where Christ himself gives a counsel about us missing the mark, or sinning. He says, slow down your sinning, right? That's what he says. He says, just Push the brakes. Sin a bit less. This, this is what Jesus is saying? No. He says, stop. In both cases, go now and leave your life of sin. And the other, in, the, in the other one, he says, stop sinning. I have an uncle. He loves to say jokes. He absolutely loves it. So when we were younger, every time we, we saw him, we knew that he had a special joke for us. Right? And, and one day... He told us about this man. 
This man bought a fancy car, you know, convertible, and he was driving in a residential area. And then he saw a stop sign. So in Quebec, so in the French culture, when you see a stop sign and you're driving and you slow down as you should, but you're actually supposed to stop, right? But in Quebec, when someone just slows down and then continues on their way, we call that an American stop. So I don't mean that to insult my American friends. Uh, and I don't know if it's the same expression in, in, in the English world, but an incomplete stop, this is how we call it. So this guy, he, he, he made an incomplete stop, an American stop. And, and you know, he, he slowed down just to make sure that there was no police around him. I guess his scanning of his environment was not accurate because he missed one officer who was there, right? And he realized it because when he looks in the rear mirror, he could see the flashing lights behind him. So he stopped his car. Of course, he's annoyed, and he was saying a bunch of words that I cannot say from this stage. The police officers walk to his door. He, you know, presses the button, and the windows go down. And he yells at the officer, look, I slowed down. What's your problem? What did I do? I told you I slowed down. And very calmly, the police officer grabbed his club and start hitting his car. Right? And the man, of course, is aggravated. He's like, what are you doing? Stop hitting my car. And the police officer says, okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. Just really think this through. You want me to stop or you want me to slow down? And this point, you friends, I, I like to suggest to you that God wants us to stop, not slow down. And this is clear in the text that I'm going to read to you now. He says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. There's another text I'd like us to read that will give, you, give, us, give us more insight. It says, but God dis disciplines us for our good in order that we may share what is holiness. And holiness is just another way of expressing the, the, the moral perfection of God. God wants us to be perfect. Amen? Who's happy about that? God wants us to be perfect. And, and, and sometimes people are a bit hesitant when I ask this question because they say, Dominic, I'm sinful. How can I be called perfect? How, how can I aspire to perfection in this world? But again, I want to remind you that this is what God is calling us to be. Let's read a quote from Jerry Bridges. He says, to be holy is to be morally what? Blameless. It is to be separated from sin, therefore consecrated to God. Holiness, nothing, than, not, nothing other than holiness um, than the conformity to the character of God. Now, someone could say, Dominic, that's impossible. Impossible. Well, I would dare to say, yes, it is possible. We have examples in the Bible. The first is Job. Was Job a human being, guys? Yes, absolutely. And this is, this is the report card God gave Job. He says, there is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you, that Satan, incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Job, a human being, received the grade A plus from God. Blameless. A human being, right? Another one. A couple this time. Zechariah and Elizabeth. This is the report card they get from God. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees. What? Blamelessly. So I'm sharing these texts with you guys to challenge the belief that perfection is not attainable. What we should ask ourselves is, what is my conception of perfection? And is it compatible 
or, or does it correspond to what the Lord says about perfection? So, can we agree on one fact this morning? The people who are going to be saved will be perfect. Can we say that? Yeah. In the sight of God, not, not, not from a human perspective. I want to know if we can all say with confidence, the people who will be saved will be perfect. Who can say that with certainty and assurance? That's good. But I'd like to convince those who are less confident. I'd like to illustrate this fact with this example. Imagine a large bucket of water. And in the bucket, there's, of course, water. And the water symbolizes sin. Okay? Large bucket of water. The water symbolizes sin. And then you have a sponge that you throw in the water. So very soon, the sponge becomes saturated with water. Yes? And the water represents sin. And the sponge represents humanity or anyone who's part of the human race. So at some point, as a human being, I recognize that I'm a sinner, that I'm saturated with sin, and I need outside help. I need us. I can't do it myself. I need outside help. I accept the sacrifice of Jesus. I, 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 I decide to live in accordance to his will. And what happens when we make that prayer, when we make that commitment, is God puts his hand in the bucket and grabs the sponge. But we know from the Bible that God hates sin. He loves the sinner, but he hates sin sin. So he's not going to be happy about this sponge being filled with water. So what is he going to do? He's going to start to squeeze, right? To get rid of that water, to get rid of that sin. And we call that what? Sanctification, right? But here's my question. Let's say I'm still 70% saturated with water, but I am in God's hand and God is squeezing the water out, but it happens that I die during this process. Will I be saved? I'm in God's hand, remember. And God is doing his work on me, and I die. Will I be saved? That's my question. Someone says yes in the back. So we have to remember something here. The person is in God's hand. Who wants to be in God's hand here? The person is in God's hand and God is working in them. Even if that work is not completed, because you're in God's hand, you will be saved. That's the most important part. Being in God's hand. And the reason why we want to be in God's hand is because the perfection we're talking about here is not dependent on me. This perfection is a gift to me. I repeat, this perfection is a gift that we receive. Now, Jeremiah has a very interesting way of saying this, okay? He says... Can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard its spot? I like to switch it around sometime to make my wife laugh. I say, can a bald man grow his own hair, right? <laughs> I wish it was possible. I really wish. Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. So here we have Jeremiah recognizing what Tangney said, we do not have the means to be perfect in us. We need outside help. Ezekiel talks about this help. And this is what he says. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. 
I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And the verse continues to say, I will make you able to follow my commandments and statutes. So who does all the work? God is the one purging the sin, our tendency to to miss the mark away from us. He's doing the work. And perfection happens when he grabs us out of that bucket. Amen? When God touches us, we become pure. Amen? There was a young man. He, he, he was a devout man. And, and, and he saw a vision and, and, and he, he became excited about it. But he knew that it, was, it was something special. Right? And, and once he understood he was in the presence of God, he became scared. He thought he was going to die. But God touched him. We're talking about Isaiah here. Right? And then it was stated that you're pure now because I touched you. When you are in God's hand, you are pure. When you are in his hand, I want to make that very clear. When you are in his hand. So the main point here is we want to make sure that the work is being done by the Lord in us. Another word of saying that is God in us. John 15 verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Right? But he says that if you remain in me, that's what we have to do in him and us. That's the perfection, guys. It's just like having a scale. You know, uh, uh, until maybe a year or two ago, I despised going on the, on the scale. Right? Because I knew the number was a lot higher than... What it should be is still a little bit, but, you know, God is working with me. I can't do it on my own. But if we continue with the scale analogy, there are two things that can appear on the scale when we're talking about salvation, right? A very simple way to understand the verdict is when you step on the scale, will it show Jesus? Very simple. Will it show Jesus when you step on the scale? Because Jesus has to be in us, right? Jesus has to be in us. And as he is in us, we are perfect. Amen? Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Philippians 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Again, it's external help. Perfection is attainable through, the, through the, us allowing Christ to live where? In us. And it will be comprehensive. Self-control, comprehensive perfection. In the book of Revelation, we have a very interesting invitation. And, and, and in this chapter 3 of Revelation, you have a, a description of all the churches throughout history. And then when you reach the last church, is the church of Laodicea. And, 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 and Christ makes a diagnosis. It says that this church is sick. It believes that it's rich. But it's poor. It believes that it has engrossed itself with goods. It believes that it has a, a crystal clear understanding of what's happening. But God says that it needs medication for, for, for their sight. And after providing this you know, prescription for their ailments, he doesn't stop there. He says, I want to personally provide you with treatment. Revelation 3 verse 20, he says, I want to... I'm knocking at the door of your, of, of your heart, and I want to come in. I want to spend time with you. I'm going to have a meal with you. And those who actually become overcomers are those who let me in. If, if, if you want to be an overcomer, if you want to be perfect, that's the recipe. Let him Christ in. I'm going to read one last text, and then I'll be done. 
This is from the book, um, Desire of Ages. Many are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Sorry, this is Steps of Christ. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity. Has anyone felt like this? It causes you to feel that God cannot accept you, but you need not despair. She continues, what you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. We can choose today to ask God to pick us up from this bucket of, wa of filthy water of sin. This bucket of filthy water of sin. Everything depends on the right action of the will, the power of choice God has given to man. It is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affection, but you can choose what? To serve him. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus, your whole nature will be brought under the control of what? The Spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon Him. Your thoughts will be what? In harmony with Him. To me, that's a perfection. That, that's a description of perfection, yes? Let's read that last part again. Your affections will be centered upon Him and your thoughts will be in harmony with Him. Is it our prayer this morning to have our affections centered on Christ? That our thoughts and feelings be in harmony with him and his will. If it's your desire this morning, please stand up with me. We'll have prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this time spent together studying this important topic of how you want to make us perfect. We pray that this morning we can recommit ourselves to you and re reiterate our desire to allow you to be sovereign in our life. Please continue to manifest yourself to us in all the different ways that you always do. And please, again, help us and convince us to accept, to give you more room in our heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. We'll sing our closing hymn.